Scared to Death is explicit in every way. Please take care while listening. Whether thou art a ghost that hath come from the earth, or a phantom of night that hath no home, or one that lieth dead in the desert, or a ghost unburied, or a demon, or a ghoul, whatever thou be until thou art removed, thou shalt find here no water to drink. Thou shalt not stretch forth thy hand to our own. Into our house enter thou not. Through our fence break through thou not. We are protected, though we may be frightened. Our life you may not steal, though we may be scared to death. Welcome to Scared to Death, Creeps, Peepers, Roberts, and Annabelles. I'm Dan. Hello, Dan. I'm Bob. Hey, Bob. Hey. Just <laughs> kidding. I'm Lindsay. <laughs> Funny guy. Funny guy. Funny guy, Bob. <sighs> uh, we are less than two weeks away from Halloween, as everyone hears this. Yes, yes. Yes. Logan did such a great job changing our set. For those of you watching on YouTube, or if you just want to peek over there, um, Time Suck and Scared to Death Studios got the uh, fall treatment from Logan. And Ollie, one of his sons. Oh, so cute. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, just over a week away from our live October show, Scared to Death Live Haunted Halloween True Tales of Hallow's Eve Horror 2. Uh, we'll be telling several Halloween-themed stories that will only be heard by those who attend. We'll be telling those stories Thursday, October 27th, 6 p.m. Pacific Time through Moment. And then you'll be able to rewatch the show, if you uh, get a ticket, for seven days following the event, which includes Halloween night. Halloween, Halloween. Looking forward to dressing up and uh, chatting it up with many of you, or at least responding to many of your questions in the comment thread on that show. And it's badmagicmerch.com for tickets. Big banner for the show at the top Can't of the site. Can't miss it cannot miss it and uh another another uh merch announcement real quick awesome new drop featuring the legend of kushtika from episode 122 and that's the uh shape-shifting creature that is half man half otter uh comes from uh southern alaskan folklore mm -hmm. and really loving the look of this one uh, also it's almost halloween so why not get a pumpkin head tea featuring jack-o-lantern uh take on a black-eyed kid Kind of fun, darkly whimsical. Um, so many cool designs. I mean, Logan has been on a tear for months now. I, I mean, he always is kicking out lots of designs, but he has been uh, particularly, and this is his own, by own his own admission, particularly inspired recently. It's funny, like it's when, crazy when you're a creative person. It mm -hmm. just if you're not a creative person, you may not understand this, but it does just come in waves mm -hmm. where it's like you you can't control it. Like have like living with a writer. It's like, I know yeah. like sometimes it's like, sorry, I'm in a writing groove. And it's like, okay, see you in however many hours it lasts for. Yeah. 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 You don't know exactly how it's going to, and, and you know, Logan is, I think him and I are similar temperaments that way mm -hmm. where you can, when you're not feeling it, we both just push through it. And, you, and when course. you, and when you've done it enough, you can still kick out things that people enjoy. Yeah. But there is a little extra magic sometimes. Mm -hmm. And he's been in a, a, a magical groove for a while. Magical man. <laughs> the magic man. Uh, what kind of tear? Oh, wait, before. How I almost skipped. dare you I almost not skipped talk about charity. charity? All right, so we've got our totals in. And this month, yeah. we are donating to Guide Dogs for the Blind. Our total donation is $15,029 with an additional $1,669. Uh, being added to the scholarship fund, which we'll be talking about. Just hang tight. We're almost there. We'll be talking about that in January. Uh, and just as a reminder, uh, Guide Dogs for the Blind believes in connecting people, dogs, and communities to transform the lives of individuals with visual impairments. And for more information or to make your own donation or whatever you might need, go to guidedogs.com. Perfect. And that's all. That's a, good, that's a good one. Goodbye. <laughs> what kind of terror do you have for us today? So well, not done. Well, Daniel son, yeah. I have three stories. Oh, that's right. Three, three, three. Yes, I have uh, a classic haunted house, mm -hmm. uh, which is, I, I really am into that one. The man in the closet, which like closets. Mm -hmm. And then maybe, possibly a tale about the legendary dog man. Oh, okay. We have talked about Dogman in the past, and there's a couple different legends there. I'm curious to see which one this is. Yeah, yeah. Maybe right. less of a legend, more of an encounter with the legendary Dogman. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Um, yeah, I know that you've been trying to pick, uh, you know, we always try and pick scary stories, but we are trying to ratchet up just a little bit for October. Gotta do it. And I'm, I'm doing the same thing. Uh, don't want to build up expectations too high, but I, I feel like I have two really good ones. Uh, the first one is a story that involves a young man from Ohio, ah! the Cleveland area, actually, ah! uh, getting tangled up with what appears to be some real creepy occultists on a uh, October night over four decades ago. 
And then I have a story about a very spooky haunted doll that may still be out there somewhere today. Ooh, in circulation. Possibly. Possibly. Before I show off my socks, Dan, can hmm? I borrow your notebook? I yeah. misplaced mine. And so I'm you can just use mine today. Yeah, exactly. This well, here look, we go. Look at this little cutie pie. Look at that <laughs> little cute little mothy man guy. <laughs> that's No, that's the moth lady. Moth lady. How could I mistake her shoes <laughs> and her sweet lips? <laughs> uh, okay. So ready to uh, show off those socks and then we can get started? Yes. I'm showing off the socks that I'm most terrified of. Aliens. Mm. Fluffy, floofy aliens. How's that? <laughs> perfect. Whoop. Okay, first story perfect for this time of year. Uh, brings uh, many of the things we've talked about here on Scared to Death into one story. A mysterious disappearance. Uh, the very liminal, how thin is the veil between this world and others time around Halloween. And a cult possibly behind not one but two deaths. A uh, quick note before I jump in. Few creative narrative liberties have been taken with certain moments in this sad and disturbing true story that in some ways uh, normally would be more fitting for a true crime podcast. Time now for the tale of the Halloween cult. Halloween 1981 should have been a fun time for 17-year-old Kurt Soba. The high school junior lived with his parents in a quiet blue-collar neighborhood on the outskirts of Cleveland. He was the youngest of four sons, the baby of the family, and as such, the closest to his parents. Unlike many teens his age, especially those coming up in the age of MTV and punk rock, Kurt never seemed to have any real disagreements with anyone at school, nor his neighbors, certainly never in trouble with the police. It appears that the one time Kurt did decide to really cut loose, October 23rd, just a week before Halloween and almost exactly 41 years before this episode is released, he would pay a steep, steep price. On the afternoon of Friday, October 23rd, Kurt felt conflicted. Come on, man. The voice of Sam, a friend of his, came staticky through the phone. It's going to be fun. Costumes and shit. The girls are going to be drunk as fuck. <laughs> Sam was talking about a Halloween party the following day, a Friday, in Newburgh Heights, full of college girls and other people in their 20s. Girls in their 20s. But Kurt didn't really feel like going. Whenever he went out with Sam, he seemed to always get more than he bargained for. <laughs> it wasn't like Sam was a bad guy. He just ran around with some strange people. Most of Kurt's friends hung out with their friends from high school or the friends of their older siblings. His brother's friends were constantly around. But Sam hung out with a crowd that no one knew much about. All anyone knew about them was that they wore a lot of black clothing. A lot of them seemed to have motorcycles. And they wore a lot of makeup, even the dudes. No one knew how old they were. Some said they were high schoolers from Cleveland. Sam said they'd recently graduated but couldn't say where they'd graduated from. The couple times that Kurt hung out with them, they'd make vague mentions about work a couple towns over but didn't exactly say what that work was. The way they talked about it, it seemed like they were much older than Kurt, maybe late 20s, maybe even older than that. Okay, have it your way, Sam said. Have fun humping the sofa cushions. Wait. Kurt looked around his room at the familiar little league trophies and the posters on the walls, tried to come up with a compromise. He didn't want Sam to be the only high schooler at this party. That seemed unsafe. And Sam was his friend, his oldest friend. They'd been really close as toddlers. Their moms were friends. They'd grown a bit distant as they'd gotten older. Kurt missed the old Sam, the Sam that knew every dinosaur and how to survive in the wilderness with a pack of matches and a canteen of water. I'm waiting, Sam sing-songed. I'll go with you, Kurt said, but I gotta be home by 10. Got it, midnight, Sam said. <laughs> 10, Kurt corrected. 11.30? Kurt sighed. I'll meet you at the bus stop at 8. Then he hung up. He didn't feel great about the idea of this party. He didn't like parties where he didn't know everybody. And the idea of being around Sam's weird friends while everyone was in costume, it did make him a little nervous. But it was only a party, two hours tops. And he didn't want to be some kind of social recluse, recluse did he? Even the dorkiest kids at school still got together to watch horror movies and play role-playing games around Halloween. Kurt didn't want to spend another Halloween tagging along with his brothers who always treated him like a baby. That evening, Kurt said goodbye to his parents, told him he was going to a party, and headed down the street to the bus stop. The night was a lot chillier than he'd expected. His t-shirt felt paper thin. The leaves crunching underfoot were the only sound. Nobody was driving or walking around this time of night, and the yellow glow of the streetlights formed warm pools of light on the asphalt. Everything else was dark. He shivered, bracing his shoulders against the wind, and wondered if he should go back and get a jacket. He turned around and frowned. There were three people standing in his driveway. At least he thought they were people. He could only see dark shapes. He wondered if it was his mom, dad, one of his brothers, but these figures weren't quite their sizes and they were standing so still 
Why would his family be standing st so still like that? Kurt! He startled and turned back around, spotting Sam at the bus stop. And then when Kurt turned back to face his house, the three figures had vanished. Kurt! Sam skidded to a halt in front of him. Dude, what's up? You high right now? Without me? Kurt shook his head, wondering if he'd imagine the entire thing. No, he said. Suddenly, he just wanted to get the whole night over with. Wanted it to be hours later when he was back in bed and he could hear his mom and dad watch the news on the TV downstairs. But now he had to go with Sam. He'd promised. The bus pulled up and Sam started asking Kurt if he could borrow the bus fare and Kurt was busy telling him to get his own money that he didn't notice, or so busy that he didn't notice the flyer stapled to a telephone pole nearby. It was a police flyer that said, Halloween can be a prime opportunity for criminals to strike. Roving groups pretending to be children in costume have been known to target this area. Please report any suspicious activity to... But someone had scratched out the phone number. By Saturday morning, Dorothy Sova was getting very worried. Usually, Kurt came home by 10 or 11 when he went out, and he only stayed out if his parents knew that he was sleeping over. But that morning, Dorothy had peered into Kurt's room only to see his bed fully made, never slept in. Dorothy began calling Kurt's friends while Ken Sova, his dad, searched the area. He had a few places on his list. Maybe Kurt was at a friend's house. Maybe he'd stop by the 7-Eleven for a breakfast sandwich on his way home. Maybe he'd gotten up early and went for a run, though that seemed unlikely. In each place, there was no sign of Kurt. On Sunday, his parents decided that it was time to report Kurt missing with the Cleveland police. They felt their best chance of finding him would be beating the pavement themselves, so to speak, and they continued looking with other family and friends in tow. They were now hoping that he'd gotten lost, maybe had amnesia? That was best case scenario. Dorothy and her other sons papered the neighborhood with missing flyers. Family and friends searched ravines, schoolyards, even dumpsters for any sign of him. Later, a few people would report that they found it odd that in every place they looked for Kurt, when they went back, the area would be full of shredded flyers. Many copies of that police flyer, warning of suspicious activities, roving groups pretending to be trick-or-treaters. On Sunday afternoon, Dorothy turned up a lead. Kurt friend, or Kurt's friend had told her that he'd been at a party Friday night in Newburgh Heights, less than two miles from where the Sovas lived. She went to the duplex on Harvard Street where she heard the party was held. Kurt's friends had told her to look for a woman named Susan. When Dorothy went to the door, a young woman answered. Dorothy was immediately taken aback by the woman's thick, dark hair and lush lips. Though pale, she seemed like the healthiest woman Dorothy had ever seen, like her skin was glowing from the inside out. A red satiny bathrobe she was wearing clung to her form like cellophane. Susan? Dorothy said hopefully. I'm babysitting, the woman said in a strange monotone voice. Dorothy's maternal instincts kicked in. She knew the woman was looking after, she knew when a woman was looking after a child and when she wasn't, and everything was telling her that there were no children on the premises. Why was she lying? What did she know about Kurt? What was she trying to cover up? Her stomach sank. Oh, Dorothy said, trying her best to sound like she believed the woman. Do you know where Susan is? She's working, the woman said in that same strange monotone. She then inched the door closer to being closed, and Dorothy spoke quickly. Would you ask her to call me? She wedged her hand in the doorway to keep the door from shutting, now desperate. I, I can come in and give you my phone number. The woman paused, her eyes finding Dorothy's. Something seemed to pass between them at that moment, though Dorothy couldn't seem to say later what it was. It was like the woman gave up immediately. Or like she knew that there was no use fighting Dorothy because Dorothy wouldn't win anyway. There's a pen and paper on the console table, she said carelessly. She watched Dorothy carefully as she wrote her name and number down and added that it was urgent. Ring! Ring! Dorothy startled. The phone was ringing. Suddenly the woman was more alert. I need to take this, she said, trying to usher Dorothy out. Do you think it could be Susan? Dorothy said hopefully. Maybe I could talk to her. No! The woman's voice climbed forcefully, almost a yell, and she crowded up towards Dorothy. Dorothy could now smell her. Even if the woman looked beautiful, she smelled awful, like rotting meat and putrid vegetables. What kind of perfume was that? Out! Out! The woman forced her outside. The last thing Dorothy caught a glimpse of was a large, dark robe thrown carelessly over the back of a chair. Wait, what? Dorothy blinked, but the door slammed shut. Try as she might, she couldn't hear what the woman was saying on the phone inside or couldn't understand it. Was it in some other language? Dorothy didn't know what to do. She went home and waited with Ken and her sons, praying that Kurt was alive and that he wasn't wrapped up in whatever that woman was into. Later that night, the phone would ring, and Ken would dash over to it. One look with his wife confirmed that they both hoped it was something to do with Kurt. Hello, Ken said. Hello, this is Susan, the voice said. Someone named Dorothy said to give her a call about Kurt. Do you know Kurt? Ken asked quickly. Do you know where he is now? The voice made a thoughtful sound. Mm, he was at my party, I think. 
Tall kid, longish blonde hair. That's him, Ken said. Beside him, Dorothy squeezed his hand. Where is he? Oh, I don't know, the voice said, and Ken deflated. He'd been so hopeful. And as his hope and euphoria faded away, he began to hear a sinister quality in Susan's voice. Was she toying with them, playing with them? Did she know more than she let on? What can you tell us about Kurt? Ken's voice was gruff. Listen, you better tell me before I call the police and have them bring you in for questioning. But instead of being intimidated, Susan just laughed. The sound reminded Ken of the chime of a bell, the way girls laughed in his teenage years. The high, sweet sound laced with something just the slightest bit sex sexual. Some flirtatious note that only the girl and her target could recognize. He felt suddenly dizzy and shook his head. Why the fuck was he thinking about that? I don't know him, Susan said. But you should ask Sam. He knows a lot about Kurt. She giggled to herself again. A lot more than you two do, probably. And then the line went dead. Ken wanted to bang his head against the wall. What the fuck was happening? His son was missing, and every turn seemed more confusing than the last. He used to think he recognized everyone in his little suburb, that that was the point of living life in a suburb, someplace calm and safe. But these days, no one's voice sounded familiar, and the friends showing up to volunteer to help them didn't look like anyone Ken recognized. One thing he knew for sure, he had to talk to Sam. Ken and Dorothy showed up at Sam's house just 15 minutes later, without umbrellas, even though it was pouring down rain. They didn't care that it was late. Kurt was their son. They'd show up anywhere at any time for him. To their surprise, Sam seemed like he'd been expecting them. As Sam's parents led Dorothy and Ken to the living room, and lightning lit up the house from outside, they were shocked to see the boy they thought of as a little bit of a rebel, a little bit of a troublemaker, looked like a scared child in pajamas that needed to be tucked in. His eyes were rimmed with red, and he seemed like he'd been crying. I'm scared. He whispered, his voice trembling. Just tell us what happened, Dorothy pleaded. So Sam did. He said that Kurt had been drinking heavily. Both Ken and Dorothy frowned. They didn't sound like their son at all. Kurt rarely drank. Sam said that he was drinking something mixed with Everclear, an incredibly potent alcohol. When Dorothy pointed out that Kurt and Kurt's friends didn't drink very much, Sam said, but they drink a lot. Dorothy and Ken shared a troubled glance and Ken nodded to Sam. Keep going, he said. Sam told them how Kurt had started to get really drunk, maybe started to get sick. He'd been stumbling around, knocking things over like he'd lost control of his body. Sam took him outside to get some air. Because the night had been so cold, Sam went back in to find his jacket to give to Kurt. But then when he went back outside, Kurt was gone. Who were these people? Ken pressed, trying not to lash out in anger at Sam for him, not having already told authorities all of this. Are they friends of yours? Uh, uh, I, I, I can't tell. Sam mumbled, a tear slipping down his face. Then he moaned softly. They just said it was a costume, that, that they were playing pretend. Dorothy leaned forward. She'd felt hysterical at a point in Sam's story, driven mad by fear and anger, but now somehow she felt clear-headed. Who are they, Sam? I'm scared, Sam whispered. Ken grabbed his hand. Who are they, Sam? They're... And then Sam's eyes skittered to the living room window and he screamed. A crack of lightning swept over the room and Dorothy and Ken saw them, three figures staring inside. Ken raced outside into the pouring rain, not caring what he was doing or how stupid it was. With every muddy step, he felt closer to something, some act that would either help him find his son or avenge his son and punish the people who'd taken him away. He stepped on something hard, a rock. With his fingernails, he dug it out of the ground and held it. Ken! Ken! Come back! Dorothy screamed, charging into the night after him. Ken spun around, holding the rock. He thought he saw the figures nearby, but the lightning made it hard to tell. Sometimes it looked like three, sometimes it looked like dozens. He staggered out blindly, holding the rock like a weapon. Ken, something whispered, and he turned around. In the huddled mass of dark figures, a pale, seductive face stared out at him, red lips curving into a smile. He charged after it and felt something slam into his back, throwing him to the ground. He spun around, holding the rock overhead. Ken, Ken, it's me! Dorothy sobbed, her hair plastered to her forehead. It's me, Ken! Ken held his wife and looked around. All the figures were gone. The now terrified couple got into their car and went home. On Wednesday, October 28th, five days after Kurt left home, his dead body was found in a ravine behind a warehouse on Harvard Street. His remains were found just 500 yards from the duplex where he'd last been seen alive, in a ravine that had been searched before by volunteers when it turned up nothing. The police combed the area for more clues. They found Kurt's left shoe wedged in some rocks less than 12 feet away from his body. They were never able to locate his right shoe. His body was taken to the Cuyahoga County Coroner's Office for an autopsy. The coroner determined that he had died 24 to 36 hours before his body was found, which meant that after, he, which meant that he had been alive for at least three days after he left the party. What the coroner could not determine, however, was the, was the exact cause of his death. What had happened to him during those three days? 
Former Chief Deputy Coroner Lester Adelson said that on the basis of the things that they saw and equally important, the things that they did not see, they felt that Kurt had died from instantaneous physiologic death. Very fancy way of saying sudden death. Sudden death with no known cause. The person is fine one moment. Moments later, they are inexplicably dead. Possibly scared to death. The manner of death was signed out as probable accidental. The coroner said that they determined that because they had eliminated everything else. Kurt had not been beaten or traumatized any way from what they could tell. His blood alcohol level of 0.11, not nearly high enough to end his life. No hard drugs were found in his system. No pre-existing natural disease. Adelson would say that this was a diagnosis by exclusion. To members of Kurt's family, it sounded like they just had no idea what happened to him. No one had any idea what those figures they'd seen were either. What they must have done to Kurt. More strange reports would soon follow. On Monday, three days after he disappeared, another one of Kurt's friends, Dave Trinsnick, would claim that he saw Kurt and another boy walking along a busy street less than a mile from the Sova home. David was on his way to a job interview when he spotted Kurt, who was someone uh, who was with someone he didn't recognize. David pulled over to offer him a ride, but at the same time, a van pulled up and Kurt, or whatever or whoever it was, looked exactly like Kurt, got into it, vanishing around the next bend in the road. Also on Monday, a stranger who had been seen hanging around the Sova's neighborhood recently noticed Kurt's missing flyer in the window of a local record store. He went into the store, disturbingly told the manager that she might as well take the flyer down. He said they're going to find him dead in two days. No one's going to know why he died. Then he left the store. The manager was skeptical at the time of his prediction, thought he was crazy. Soon, she, for obvious reasons, was afraid of this stranger. The next day, before the store opened, the stranger left flowers in a note, and the note said, Roses are red, the sky is blue, they'll find him dead, and they'll find you too. She reported this to police. Police questioned him, said he was just a crazy from Detroit. But if he was just crazy, how did he know so much? The manager never saw him again, and because Kurt was only missing at that point, the police released him. Later, when Kurt was found dead, the man had disappeared, and the police were unable to locate him. Then on Wednesday, the very day Kurt's body would be found, his mother Dorothy received an early morning phone call from that odd woman, Susan. The call came in at around 3.30 a.m. Susan told Dorothy that someone was sleeping in her basement and that perhaps it was Kurt. Dorothy got chills down her spine. Was the woman one of them that Sam had been talking about? And was she now trying to lure Dorothy and Ken to her house? Ken couldn't resist going. He needed to track down every lead to his son. When he went to the complex's basement, all he found was a cot. At least that's, that's what all, that's, was all he found on the floor. Lifting his eyes to the ceiling, he saw an intricate network of strange symbols. Symbols that didn't look like anything in a human language. And then Ken got the fuck out of there. Ken was more convinced than ever that the figures, the symbols, all of it was connected to something terrible. Something that, as he would come to believe just a few hours later, had taken his son's life. Then, just three months later, another mysterious tragedy would occur. The death of a boy Kurt used to know, 13-year-old Eugene Kevitt, seemed to have an eerie resemblance to Kurt's. Eugene was found in another ravine behind Harvard Street, two and a half miles from the place Kurt's body had been discovered. Both boys had been missing for some time preceding their deaths, and Eugene's right shoe was also never found. Coincidence? Or part of some strange ritual? An autopsy later determined that Eugene had died just simply from falling into the ravine, an accident, or maybe he was pushed. These deaths would leave behind so many questions. Focusing specifically on Kurt's death, how exactly did he die? Where had he been for the five days after he left home? Had he ever slept in the basement of the duplex? What do those symbols mean? Was there any connection between his death and the death of Eugene? Most concerning, who were the mysterious figures that seemed to come alive just before Halloween? Were they connected to Sam's mysterious friends? Who were those people? Sadly, Kern's parents would never have these questions answered. On July 12, 2001, Ken passed away at the age of 68. Then on December 7, 2014, Dorothy passed away at the age of 76. Two of his brothers, Kevin and Kenneth, have also since passed away. His third and final sibling, Kevin, is still looking for answers. Dang. Eek. Their whole family's wiped out. Mm-hmm. I mean, just a mm. long time ago now, about 40 years. But still, that, ooh, wow, ooh. Yeah. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. Yeah, just, I mean, again, like, more of possibly, like, a true crime story, but then there was this weird, Sophie found in uh, some reports, some weird, like, paranormal elements around the story. Well, yeah, and, uh, like the, those the mysterious figures. figures. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Susan. Susan's bad. She's naughty, Elvira. 
Mm -hmm. Ugh. And what a creepy, fucked up thing to do. There's someone sleeping in my basement. Like, what? Mm -hmm. What? Earlier in the basement of that apartment complex. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's yeah. like, so you, you called the parents who have a missing child? Like, she's just a bad human. Mm-hmm. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. Are there pictures? Yeah, one picture. This first one, uh, well, a couple pictures. This first one, picture of Kurt, you know, sadly, no. uh, shortly before he disappeared. Um, since it felt like Sam's friends could have belonged to some strange occult group. This is just a pic of some occultists. Maybe maybe it was uh, people uh, uh, looking like that roving around before Halloween. They don't look scary to me. I know. But it's uh, what some people would find scary. I know that lady's outfit in the front is actually pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she looks great. Uh, yeah, very like cool goth. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, um, I don't know, like with, the, with that. When they do that face mask where like the darkness just goes down to the bridge of their nose covering their eyes, that mm -hmm. hard line. Yeah. It is a cool look. Yeah. Kind of like tribal, occulty. I don't know. I, I mean, and there's a certain element of sexiness to it. Yeah. It's it's the mm -hmm. same way that like uh, masquerade parties yeah. are so exciting and mm -hmm. enticing, yeah, uh, intoxicating. Sexy. That's the word I yeah. want. Yeah, where it's like, ooh, what's going on behind there? Uh, you can pull off that outfit. Thanks. Uh, one more. Occult... Are you saying that because my boobs are out today? Mm -hmm. One more occult <laughs> photo just for funsies. Oh yeah, we have it's a cool photo. Yeah, we have that like a similar. Uh, head thing right here, skull mm -hmm. guy thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, with the runes on it. Yep. No, 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 no. The actual this. Oh, you yeah. talking about this guy? No, this guy, not with the runes on it. That guy. That he, there's runes too. You just can't see him. Oh. There's some carvings up top. Ew. Yeah. <laughs> Ew. Uh, yeah. So that story. I mean, when Sophie, it's a little atypical, but it really creeped me out. It is creepy, and, and I found it very gripping. You yeah, know, it's like you can get a little jaded when you're like, when I'm going over, because then I'll you know like finesse the story into my own kind of like storytelling language, mm -hmm. like rhythm and stuff. But that one, I was like, I didn't want to stop reading it. I was like, what the what the hell is happening in the story? Yeah. Where's it going? I had wrote down, as soon as he went missing, I was like, but where's Sam? And I was a little bit annoyed with his parents. I'm like, so wait, Sam, you're friends with Sam's parents. And Sam was like a childhood friend. Mm -hmm. You didn't, did you know he was going to this party with Sam? You waited three days to talk to Sam? That didn't mm. make sense to me. That made zero yeah. sense to me. If the entire community is looking for Kurt and everyone's talking about it and then Sam and his family are not a part of it and they're supposedly good friends of yours, that is concerning. Immediately right off the rip. Yeah, that is. Yeah. I don't know why that, did the, that didn't set up a red flag with me right away, too, but absolutely. Yeah, my, my guess is that, you know. Or maybe Sam they did talk to him initially and they just kind of glossed it over. Maybe that was more of a follow-up conversation. It wasn't worded that way. Uh but maybe. Maybe. I mean, I also think there's a possibility that Sam told his parents that, you know, he felt responsible. He was somehow involved. And as parents, you immediately protect your kid. So maybe mm. it was like, okay, we all hunker down. We stay here. Yeah, maybe. We don't get involved. Maybe. You know. Yeah. Dang, dang, Hopefully dang. Hopefully he'll turn up. Yeah. Uh, and then just totally unrelated. But when you said Everclear, I immediately was like, oh, purple drink. <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 <laughs> Take me yeah, back yeah. to Lafitte's. Lafitte's, yeah. Oh, my God, if you're in New Orleans... Do yourself a favor. Go to Lafitte's and get some purple drink, which no, is know that it's strong. So strong. It's basically it doesn't taste like it. No, it's very good. It's very good. It's basically a grape slushy, mm -hmm. like a really good grape slushy mm -hmm. with a shit ton of Everclear in it, and it's super fun. <laughs> uh, are you ready to move on from a story of two young men who have been killed in some sort of occult rituals, perhaps to, I, the, to the story of a demonic doll? Oh yeah, I'm stoked about this doll. Yeah, no real setup with this one. And honestly, surprised we haven't come across this one before. Okay. Because uh, Lorraine Warren, demonologist, uh, does make an appearance. So it's somewhat well known, I guess. This could, this could be a future horror movie. Mm. Uh, Going to dive directly into it. Okay, let's have it. Time now for the tale of Susie the Doll. In West Haven, Connecticut, 1983, the Platt family were celebrating Heather's sixth birthday. They weren't a wealthy family by any stretch of the imagination, but they had enough to throw a small party at their home. Linda and Jerry Platt had been married 18 years, and they had three children. Laura was the oldest, Lisa was in the middle, and then there was little Heather. They were all good kids, never really gave their parents much grief. They all got along well together, especially Lisa and Heather. Lisa had been obsessed with her baby sister from the day she was born, and the two were almost inseparable. Among the birthday gifts that had been brought for Heather was a doll made for her by her, aunt Rob, by her aunt, Robin. Robin had spent a long time on the large handmade doll, who was as big as Heather, and she tried to ensure that the doll looked just like her. 
right down to the brown pigtails in her hair tied with little ribbons. And there will be a picture later. Heather fell in love with the doll instantly, who she named Susie. Heather had Susie by her side the rest of that whole day, and of course took her to bed with her that night. And later that night, after everyone else, or ev after everyone, excuse me, was soundly asleep, Linda awoke to a loud noise at 2 a.m. It was like a growling noise, similar to the sound of a cat growling, but louder. Feeling uneasy, she nudged her husband Jerry awake. After taking a second to ride himself, Jerry was now startled by the disturbing noise as well. It sounded like it was coming from outside the bedroom window, so he got out of bed and opened it, thinking maybe some animals were fighting outside. What he saw was anything was what was what he saw was unlike anything he had ever seen or anything he ever would see again. He watched a thick dark mist floating down the middle of the street, coming closer and closer, growing louder and louder. It was like an angry black cloud, darker than any cloud he'd ever seen. Jerry would later say that it felt to him in that moment like hell itself was rolling down the street. And then the strange dark cloud dissipated. The growling stopped, and confused but no longer frightened, or at least no longer as frightened, Jerry and Linda fell back asleep. The next morning, little Heather woke up and skipped down the stairs, hand in hand with her new Susie doll. Plopping the doll down on the sofa, she went into the kitchen to say good morning to her mom and ask for a drink of milk. When Heather returned from the kitchen, she was shocked to see the sofa empty. Spinning around confused, her eyes finally rested on Susie the doll, who was now in the rocking chair in the corner of the room. What she felt in that moment was not terror, but joy. She lifted her hand to her mouth, stifled a squeal of giddy excitement because she realized that Susie the doll was alive. Heather wanted to tell others in her family, but she was afraid that no one would believe her, so she decided to keep it a secret. Over the next few days, Heather did everything with Susie, uh, constantly uh, talking to her. The family at this point thought how much Heather liked the doll was just simply adorable. And for a little while, they would continue to think it was adorable and not see any link between the doll and strange things that had begun to happen around the house. Jerry worked nights and Linda had a day job. So the family's schedule was often a little chaotic. Early one morning, Linda heard loud noises coming from the kitchen and thought that Jerry had just returned from work. She woke up, went downstairs to see uh, what on earth he was doing, and her jaw almost dropped to the floor when she got to the entrance of the kitchen and found the room absolutely trashed. The contents of every cupboard, the refrigerator, and the freezer all over the floor. As she got to work cleaning it up, Jerry did arrive home, and upon seeing the mess, he assumed it had been, you know, one or a few of the kids, marched up to their rooms to find out who to get after. They were all adamant it was not them, begging their father to believe them. He didn't know what to think. Perhaps someone had broken into the house, but there was nothing missing. Just to be safe, he called the locksmith, had all the locks changed, refusing to take any chances with his family's safety. Later that day, while his wife was at work, Jerry was upstairs when he heard a strange sound, like static from a TV, a constant buzzing. Walking to investigate, uh, excuse me, walking uh, to investigate downstairs, he indeed found that the television set was set on a channel with only static. Not too odd. He figured at first that someone had probably just left it on. But then what was very odd was when he noticed his daughter Heather sitting and staring at the snowy screen as if in a trance. And she didn't want to snap out of it until he picked her up and carried her upstairs. Soon, on another occasion, in the middle of the night, Laura and Lisa were both woken up by what sounded like children playing in the street just outside their home. Laura looked out the window but saw nobody there, though the sounds continued long into the early hours of the morning. Hours later, just after dawn, Lisa would wake up to find clumps of her hair on her pillow. Running downstairs to her mother, clearly upset, she had her check her hair, and to Linda's amazement, there was a perfect circle of hair missing from the back of her daughter's head. Heather, a bad feeling in her gut, walked away to go check on Susie the doll, who was sitting on her bed with a chunk of her sister's brown hair in her hands. Oh. Heather panicked and threw away the clump of hair. She was afraid her parents would take Susie away from her or blame her, so she didn't say a word about this to her family. Heather's parents ended up taking Lisa to see the best doctor they could afford to find the cause of her hair loss. Tests were done. It was shown that the hair had been pulled out, that it would have taken some extremely hard pulling to accomplish that. Lisa was adamant that she didn't do that to herself, but her mom wouldn't believe her. The night she was blamed for pulling out a clump of her own hair, one of the creepiest things Lisa would remember later about all this happened uh, while the family was sitting together at the dinner table. With their parents' work schedules, it was a very rare occasion for everyone to be able to eat dinner together, so it was a big deal whenever the opportunity presented itself. This night, everyone was sitting around the table, eating and laughing, except for Heather. She was eerily silent. She was staring blankly out into space like she was in a trance again of some kind. Her mother called her name a couple times and she didn't budge. 
just kept staring off into nowhere. Then, in a very low, creepy whisper, Heather suddenly said, Bad things are going to happen in this house. Oh my god. Then her trance seemingly broke and she claimed to not remember the past few moments. Had no recollection of saying what she just said. Her sister Lisa was terrified because she claimed to be watching Heather the whole time she spoke and swore that her lips never moved. Over the next few days, Lisa gained an intense hatred for Susie the doll. Her sister Heather had stopped ever wanting to play with her. She only wanted to play with Susie. Heather was becoming more and more withdrawn from everything except for playing with Susie. Lisa was also beginning to suspect that there was something wrong with Susie. Sometimes she swore that the doll's eyes followed her when she moved. The thing gave her the creeps. Then she became convinced the doll was alive. One day, Lisa wanted to go roller skating and she ran inside to get her skates. She saw Susie the doll sitting on a table in the entrance to the room uh, that she needed to enter to find them. Scared, thinking the doll's eyes felt just a little too alive today, she decided to pretend that she didn't know where her skates were, and then she, she, so she went to ask her mom to help her look for them so she wouldn't have to go into that room on her own. Lisa started to walk away to find her mom, and then after a few steps, thinking she'd heard something, turned back around to face the entrance of the room, and Susie the doll was gone. Lisa ran, told her mom that the doll had moved. She was frantic, almost on the verge of tears. Her mom seemed concerned, but just kept saying that they would, they would look for the doll. Everything's okay. She knew her mom didn't believe her. Lisa then heard a sound from the bathroom, and she and her mom now carefully opened the bathroom door, and they both saw Susie sitting on the toilet with her pants down as if she was a real girl using the restroom. The fuck? Linda was furious. She sent Lisa downstairs, went to go talk to her other children, convinced that one of them was playing a cruel joke on Lisa. No one would confess, though, to having moved the doll into the bathroom. A couple days later, Jerry was sleeping upstairs while Linda was at work and the kids were at school. He awoke to a series of crashes and bangs. Arming himself with a baseball bat, he slowly made his way downstairs to investigate. Once again, the kitchen had been completely trashed. Contents of every cupboard were spread out all, all over the floor. And then Jerry saw something that made him think that uh, a burglar or one of his kids was definitely not to blame. The chairs had been placed on top of the kitchen table balancing only on their front two legs, completely defying gravity. And then, they got, and then they all crashed onto the floor. He was now convinced that something paranormal was going on in his family's home. When Jerry picked Linda up from work that day, he told her everything that had happened, but she wouldn't hear of it. She kept insisting it had to be the kids. Jerry completely broke down in the car, pleading with her to listen to him, trying to explain it was not possible that any human could have done what he saw. Something strange and scary was happening in their home, but Linda would not be convinced. Not yet. Not until the next day, when she saw something for herself. Linda was home alone, cleaning the house when it happened. She moved Susie the doll from the couch, where Heather had left her, sat her in a rocking chair, and then decided to take a small lunch break. She made a sandwich, sat at the kitchen table, and then heard a noise. And then heard another noise, and another, and another. Getting up to investigate, she saw marbles, one after the other, bouncing down the stairs. There must be an intruder. She grabbed a kitchen knife and slowly made her way upstairs to Heather's room where the marbles were coming from. No one was there. No one was anywhere upstairs. Confused, she walked back downstairs, still on edge. When she uh, now peeked into the living room, she was startled to see all the marbles arranged together on the floor in a perfect circle. And then, laundry she'd left on the counter in a basket was now hanging off all the furniture. And Susie the doll? No longer in the rocking chair. The hair on the back of her neck stood up. She was no longer worried about an intruder. Now she was worried about ghosts. As soon as Jerry got home that night, the couple sat down and tried to talk about what they could do. They couldn't carry on and ignore what was happening. They were too scared for their children, too scared for themselves, also couldn't move out. Their finances wouldn't allow it. Not knowing what else to do, they called the reverend from their local church, and that reverend suggested they call a friend of his, demonologist Lorraine Warren. He told them that if anyone could help, it would be her. Lorraine's name was familiar to Linda. She'd heard it on television a few times. She called straight away, and thankfully, Lorraine was able to come right over. When Lorraine arrived without her husband, Ed, on this particular occasion, she said that as soon as she walked through the door, she knew something sinister was in the house. And she asked the Platt family to all sit around the table together, which they did, apart from little Heather, who was upstairs asleep. Her parents decided it would be best not to wake her. Lorraine then asked the family to all hold hands in a circle, while she concentrated and tried to make contact with whatever supernatural entity was inside the home. 
Almost immediately, sounds could be heard and a strong, unnatural wind seemed to begin circling the table. Then shouting was heard, and the family realized it must be coming from Heather. The family in the rain hurried upstairs to check on her, and they found the little girl sitting bolt upright on her bed, shouting, Get out of here! The words were clearly coming out of Heather's mouth, but it wasn't Heather's voice. It was a low, growling-sounding voice, certainly not that of a little girl. Lorraine walked over to the side of the bed and sprinkled some holy water on the child. Heather turned her head and screamed at the demonologist in that same unnatural voice, Get the fuck out of here! And then Heather fell back down on the bed, a strange growling now coming from her. And then it suddenly stopped. Heather, confused and frightened, began to cry and became herself again. Lorraine soon assured the family that their daughter was not yet fully possessed, but warned that the entity in their home, an entity she was now sure was demonic, was trying to possess her, and it was close to achieving just that. Lorraine quickly called a priest she knew well, asking if he could conduct an exorcism or a blessing soon, anything to help the family. Father McKenna would arrive, the same priest from one of last week's scared to death stories, but a decade and a half younger in this tale, and he was accompanied by another priest to assist him this time. Father McKenna gathered the Platt family in the living room, sat them all in two rows, all in front of him. He instructed them to stay still, not to look back no matter what happened. Seconds into his starting to say his exorcism prayers, the lights went out. Scratching could be heard from all around them, and Susie the doll, sitting in a rocking chair, was now violently rocking back and forth. A low growling could be heard coming from the doll. All the noises steadily built in intensity, a crucifix on the wall spun upside down. The priest now sent the family outside, saying that he and his companion needed to finish the exorcism on their own. The Platt family gathered outside the front door, all holding hands and praying, and then eventually everything inside the house fell quiet. And a few moments later, the two priests came out of the house saying that everything seemed to have been successful. But as the two men were walking away, Linda heard the rocking chair. Susie the doll was still sitting on, began to move. And all of a sudden, something clicked. She ran into the house, grabbed the doll, ran back outside, threw Susie the doll into a trash can at the end of the driveway. She and Jerry sent the kids to bed, and the two of them waited outside the entire night, watching that trash can, making sure Susie the doll did not crawl out until the garbage man came along, emptied the trash can into the truck, and drove away. With the doll now gone, the house was quiet, and nothing out of the ordinary ever happened in it, as far as I know. The Platt family came to believe that that mist they saw through the window that night Heather had been given Susie the doll was some kind of evil entity that entered their home and then attached itself to that doll and then tried to attach itself to Heather. And now I wonder, where is Susie the doll now? Yeah, no shit. Well, I was waiting for them to go back out to the garbage Mm -hmm. and burn that thing. Oh, yeah. Why not burn it? Burn the Susie. Burn the Susie. (laughs) Burn the doll. My gosh. That's really intense. Mm -hmm. I have a few pictures. Okay. Uh, This first one, back in 2015, the sci-fi channel series Paranormal Witness featured an episode about uh, this Ed and Lorraine, well, I guess Lorraine Warren story about Susie. Is that the actual doll? It's a recreation. Okay. It's like, man. So that's based on what they, you know, thought the doll looked like because, you know, it was thrown away. Yeah. Yeah. And also, that's a weird... Well, it was homemade. Remember, it was a homemade. The aunt made it. I know, but like, I don't think it would have had that kind of skin. Mm, I don't know. Maybe she. I mean, probably hard to make a doll. Here, here's another one. Another picture. Just creepy picture of uh, you know recreation of that doll in that <sighs> leather. Eek. The. And then, <sighs> and then just for a little palate cleanser, because I know that was creepy. Just uh, a little bit of a nicer picture. Oh yeah, that's so nice. This is just a nice lady with her eyeballs ripped out. You know, she just. Popped her eyeballs out. Just a doll face lady missing her eyeballs. I, I, that picture came up when I was looking for pictures of the other doll. <laughs> I was like, what is this? So disturbing. Yeah, but I don't think that that's... I From mean, a horror movie or something. Yeah, I'm like, it's not real. No, no, no. Yeah, okay. But just heard that lady with the doll face and the eyeballs out. Yee. I thought it was creepy. Yeah. Huh. I've been not so scared lately. Yeah? yeah I don't know what it is. Been more uh, fortified against these tales? I guess so. Feeling strong. You didn't get too scared at the movie the other night, too. And it, sure and it didn't. creeped me out. We saw Smile together at the theater with so Monroe. Good. I thought it was excellent. Was Monroe scared? No, I was the most scared of the three of us. So that's what I thought. I, I thought that was a really good horror movie. Yeah. I I, I think it was well done for sure. Mm-hmm. Do you want the moth lady? Sure. And uh yeah, if any uh buddies looking for a good movie to see in the theater, I mean, catch that like the latest showing. Yeah, I think I thought it was so creepy. And and yeek. Yep, and just really well done. 
Mm-hmm. Monroe was getting so upset when I would make that smile at her. She's like, okay, enough. Yeah. I think I, Monroe probably got a little more scared than she, she would let on. I think she's that age. I mean, I will say, I was going to say she, she's that age where she doesn't want to let you know how scared she is. Mm-hmm. I did jump more than, I'm a jumpier person, but I jumped more than you two in the movies. I jumped a few times and it made myself laugh so hard. And then I just thought like, poor Monroe, she is sandwiched between two jumpy jump persons. Yeah, um, I, I get into them. I like really getting into those movies in the theater. I think Man, the, it was so good. I think the difference between you and I is like you let your brain explore it as more of like a what if. You're not trying to fight it. Yeah, no, I'm always trying to fight it. No, I'm I, like, okay, it's just a movie. No, just I like, to, movie. I like to, to tell my brain that this is real. Well, this that's is, a terrible idea. But then that that's but you go there to be scared. I want to be scared. Yeah, but I want to also be able to sleep. Mm, yeah, and no, if I get, I get too scared, then not only do I not sleep, but you don't sleep. Mm. Logan, have you seen Smile yet? I have not. It's definitely on my list. God, it's so good. I think it's so good. What was the other one? The Barbarian. For the for the uh, the Barbarians, another one or Barbarian. I think it just is uh, just a one word title. I, I want to see that one. Yeah, the other one we want to watch. And um, yeah, th- this movie for for a long time. Uh, I guess what it, what would it be Annabelle's yeah that did that when we used to do that this looks awesome yeah this to me smile would be a five out of five Chuckies oh okay I would give it the highest rating wow you really liked it mm-hmm. it was I good. really did I I liked the premise I like it anytime I they it was can well executed I think anytime they can do a horror movie with a new angle is mm-hmm. is good and yep. I think it stars Kevin Bacon's daughter it does you Sosie said that Bacon? you said that and I looked it up that's absolutely Kevin Bacon and Kira Sedwick's daughter Sedwick isn't it Sedwick I don't know I think it's Sedwick. Sed or Sedge it does, I mean not that it really matters but yeah it's their daughter uh, I remember watching that she's movie. their daughter that's weird yeah it it is their daughter this creature well, well you don't know how she identifies so maybe maybe she's a they I don't know I what did you say I said I said it oh you said I it I don't think oh. anybody identifies as an it <laughs> well I don't know <laughs> Maybe, maybe, that'd maybe. Be weird, that'd be a weird thing to be offended by. Uh, it's it. <laughs> <laughs> I refuse. I, I laughing. refuse to be identified in the human realm. Listen, you I don't, don't know. I don't even know what I am. Well, no one knows what you are, <laughs> sweetheart. Um, but yeah, I was watching that movie, thinking like, God, this girl's face is so familiar. It's because she has Kevin Bacon's face. <laughs> a little bit. I think she has a blend of her dad and mom's face. No, I see a little bit of Akira's face there too. Yeah, I just see more of Kevin. Yeah. yeah, she's so she's so cute. She's so hmm? slight. Yeah, she's a teeny I, tiny little person. But they're, I, they're teeny tiny little people. Yeah, and, and actually the Bacon brothers are pay, playing at Northern Quest soon. Are they really? Yeah, I'd, go, like, see, I'd go see them. They're supposed to be so good. I'd love to see. I like. I love Kevin Bacon. Okay, let's do it. Let's okay. Do yeah, right. yeah. If we if we're free, I, I'm not even joking. Okay, you find the tickets. Okay. <laughs> Make a note. <laughs> Make a note. Are you, are you writing it down? Yeah, I write on my hand. You're so cute. Uh, okay, well I'll wait for you to write it down because just write bacon. <laughs> and then I want to see what happens. Like, are you going to come home with a few pounds of bacon? Are you going to buy Bacon Bros tickets? <laughs> like, what's going to happen? Uh, okay. Are we ready for a haunted house? Yeah. Do you have a squishy over there? I do. I have Red, red Layla. Red Layla. Uh, okay. So in this particular story, it seems like we have some evidence of the house being haunted, in my opinion. And, it, you know, it comes through, a, well, you don't know, you're about to find out. It comes in the form of a photograph. And what I always think about with photographs in these situations is like, yeah, but they could be doctored. Oh, totally, yeah. Right, of all, of all the things that you can get proof of, mm-hmm. I think that photos might be the most debated. Yeah, especially now. I mean, as as Photoshop type software has gotten more advanced, mm-hmm. I mean, you can really, really doctor it, you yeah. know, and, and make it really. I mean, for the unless you are an expert in that field, I don't think you could ever figure out that it was doctored. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. Know? yeah. Like, like it can look so real. Of course, of course. But what if the tables were turned? Yeah. And the entity was taking pictures of you. Oh, that's in- yeah. How that's, uh, creepy different. would that be? Mm-hmm. Let's find out. Okay. Okay. Dear Dan, Lindsay, and the rest of the Scared to Death crew, hello from neighboring Wyoming. I'm a huge fan of Dan's stand-up, Time Suck, and now Scared to Death. Yes. I wanted to share my story with you guys and see if it freaks you out as much as it did my family. A little bit of setup before I get started. In 2004, a few weeks after our youngest son was born, we moved into a new house. It's your typical split-level home with two bedrooms, a bath, and a den-slash-family room downstairs, and two bedrooms, a bathroom, living room, kitchen, dining room upstairs. At the time, it was me, my wife, my two stepdaughters, and our newborn son. The girls each had a room downstairs, and we put our son in the room next to ours upstairs. For a few years, everything was great. Life was normal. Nothing out of the ordinary had happened until stuff started going missing. 
None of the missing items were of great importance, though. Just small things like kitchen utensils, pocket knives, and so on. We assumed that either the kids had put them someplace they didn't belong, or they had somehow been knocked into the trash. While it was annoying and frequently caused us to question our own sanity, it definitely wasn't exorcist material. We would occasionally find some of the missing items in places we knew that we didn't put them. For example, we had to replace our refrigerator, and when we pulled out the old one, we found a spatula that had been missing for a few years. The strange part being that my wife had just pulled out the fridge a couple weeks earlier to clean behind it. About a year later, I was recovering from knee surgery and was down in our family room playing on the computer. Everyone else was in bed for the night, but that damn knee brace kept me from being able to get comfortable enough to sleep. The desk was positioned so that if you turned slightly to the left, you could see down the hall to the bedrooms and to the bottom of the stairs. I was sitting there playing games and out of the corner of my eye, I saw movement. I looked over and I saw a woman in a long nightgown go up the stairs. Assuming it was my wife checking on me, I looked at the time and decided I should at least try to get some sleep. I grabbed my crutches and hobbled up the stairs to our bedroom. And that's when I realized that not only was my wife out like a light, but she wasn't wearing a nightgown. She was sleeping in sweats and a hoodie. And as a matter of fact, I don't think she's ever owned a floor-length nightgown in almost 20 years as we've been together. I told myself it was my imagination and that it must have been, and I must have been wrong about what I thought I saw. I told my wife about it. And for the most part, we just laughed it off. Several weeks later, we were lying in bed talking And mid-sentence, my wife stopped talking, sat straight up, and whispered, I just saw your lady in the nightgown. She walked past our doorway, and she's in the baby's room. We immediately jumped up and ran after the ghost. All we found was our son sound asleep. Several days later, we were again in bed when we were reminded we weren't alone. My wife and I had just said goodnight and closed our eyes to go to sleep. Suddenly, our bed started to shake. It felt like someone had slammed their hands down at the foot of the bed several times in quick succession. We both bolted upright, looking at each other, and I started to ask, did you feel? And she interrupted with a, uh, yeah. And as fast as it started, it was over, leaving us both unable to sleep. For quite a while, that was the worst of it. We would occasionally hear our son playing in his room, alone, talking to someone, but we always wrote that off as a toddler's imagination, especially since he had a stuffed bear that he had with him every waking moment. We would hear what sounded like footsteps walking down the hallway from time to time, but we just figured it was the sounds of a house as it gets older. Then one day, I was at home with my wife. The girls were in school and our son was taking a nap. We were in the living room watching TV when we heard a very distinct noise come from upstairs. It was this horrible creaking noise my computer chair made when someone first sat in it. We looked at each other, instantly knowing that we had both heard the same sound. At the time, we didn't have a cat or a dog that could have jumped into the chair to make the sound. We went downstairs to investigate, but the family room was empty. We told one of our friends about this. She was really into ghost hunting and everything paranormal. She decided to bring over her digital voice recorder so we could do some EVP sessions. I was pretty skeptical about this since I had only seen this done on paranormal reality TV shows. While I thought it was creepy, I also figured it was mostly fake. After the kids were all asleep, we made made sure to turn off all the TVs, no stereos going. We even turned off the baby monitor to make sure we wouldn't accidentally record anything spooky that was actually just background noise. The three of us walked through the house asking questions to our invisible guests, which honestly made me feel like a complete idiot. That feeling went away when we started playing the recorder back to see if we had captured any responses. In the hallway, outside of our bedroom, when she asked if there were any spirits here right now, there was an unmistakable response. It came in the form of what sounded like a deep male voice saying one single word, pain. This sent chills up all three of our spines. But out of all the questions we asked, that was our only response. The next event stood out, took place several years after that, and still makes the hair on my arms stand on end. Our oldest daughter was about 14 or 15 and had gotten a digital camera as a gift since she was really getting into photography. She wasn't using, when she wasn't using the camera, she always set it on the headboard of her bed so it was safe from the wrath of her little brother. One morning, when getting up from school as she rolled out of bed, she stepped on her camera. Assuming she had knocked it off in her sleep that night, she set it back on the headboard and went to school. That evening, after school, 
She checked her camera to make sure she hadn't broken anything when she'd stepped on it. When she powered the camera on, the screen filled with the last picture that was taken. That picture was of her, asleep. There were several pictures of her, all of them taken in a pitch black room with only the light from the flash of the camera. In these photos, you could plainly see one of her hands under the side of her face and the other one gripping the top of her blanket, ruling out the chance that this was some sort of joke and that she had taken the pictures herself. We tried to recreate the pictures just to figure out where the mystery photographer had been. We came to the conclusion that the pictures were taken from mattress height and only a few feet away from her bed. From then on, she refused to sleep with the camera in her room. Only a few months later, we had what I feel like was the scariest event to date. It was about 11 p.m., and after checking out all of the kids, my wife and I had just gone to bed. We were laying there watching TV when we heard a blood-curdling scream come from my oldest daughter's bedroom. We immediately leapt up out of bed, flew down the stairs, and burst through her door, unsure of what was going on. She was on her bed, knees clutched to her chest, and sobbing uncontrollably. We asked what had happened, and she pointed to the foot of the bed and said, Our t- The TV fell on me. She had a corner TV stand at the foot of her bed where her TV sat, except now her TV lay screened down on her bed. Initially, the dad and me thought, okay, maybe she had a boy in here. And when they heard us walking around, he panicked, he climbed out the window, and he knocked over the TV in the process. Then I remembered that since before we moved in, her screen had been screwed in place by the previous tenants. I checked, and sure enough, it was still screwed in place. Then I thought maybe she had accidentally knocked it over while sleeping. But given that she was, and still is, very short, there was more than enough room to walk between her bed and the TV stand, and it was an old-school TV that was heavy, like with the curved screen, so that didn't seem likely either. Afterwards, while everyone was attempting to go to sleep, my mind raced, searching for an explanation for the night's events. Having watched too many ghost hunting shows, I walked through the dark house with my camera and just snapped pictures at random in hopes of possibly capturing some orbs or something that might offer some sort of proof that the culprit was in fact paranormal. When I went through the photos, I when I went through the photos I took, I found a series of two or three photos where a strange mist or smoke shape could be seen. These photos were taken in the hallway between our room and our son's room. This smoke seemed to be coming up the stairs and headed down the hallway. No one in the house had been smoking, burning candles, or anything of that nature, and at no point during the evening did any of us smell anything burning. After that, most of the activity went away. We still occasionally hear a creak here or a noise there that makes us pause, but that's about it. I've tried to do research on the house to see if anything of note ever happened here, but have always come up empty-handed. Maybe they've moved on or moved out, but either way, they've creeped us out enough for one lifetime. <laughs> Hail Nimrod and glory <laughs> and glory be to Triple M. Sincerely, Dale. Hail Nimrod, Dale. And um, yeah, that uh, interesting that the thing took photos I know. of the daughter that one night and then not not going forward. Well, she stopped sleeping with her camera in her room, so. Uh, yeah, I guess I guess so. Yeah, I guess, yeah. Maybe it was just like a photo of, uh, of opportunity. Like if right, it had like, been like left a, there. Oh, yeah, like it wasn't able to maybe bring it in or wouldn't think that way. And, and then and then I would, uh, and, they, and maybe they did just to include it in the story, but I would be freaked out uh, more like at the possibility of an intruder coming in and taking pictures of my sleeping kid. Yeah. That's so creepy. That's so creepy. That, that, that bothers me more, that thought, yeah. than a ghost. Yeah. But I mean, but 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 if it just happened the one time and nothing and, just, and the, nothing was out of place and they didn't hear anything, mm-hmm, like man, no mention of a break in, nothing like that, right? And I would, <sighs> I would, I mean, this is just where my sick brain goes. But if you had an intruder who wanted to take photos of a <sighs> child, that's so creepy. They probably want to do a whole lot more than that, and so I don't think they're just taking photos and leaving. Just, just as someone who's covered so much true crime, yeah. Sometimes they do stuff like that, and then it escalates later. Mm-hmm. It's, it's like, but it never escalated. But it never so escalated. if it was, yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, unless that was them trying to get in, and that's how the TV fell uh, off the stand. But, yeah. but, but the Either dad, way, it's but the dad said that horrific. he thought like, well, you know, I thought maybe there was like a teenage boy. Yeah, 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 and so yeah, he, yeah. He, he, yeah, he scoped true, that true, out. True. So, so no, he look into that. Yeah. And then, I mean, with the mist. And the photos of the mist later, you know, at the hallway when there was no smoke or anything in the house. I mean, when you add it all together, just all the experience, the totality of all the experiences. Yeah. But yeah, I can't recall ever hearing that detail. 
Yeah, of like a ghost uh, uh, or entity uh, yeah, taking uh, like pictures of us. Around. Uh, yeah, I know. I really liked it, and it really upset me. Like it really bothered me because you know we all sleep. I mean, I'm assuming the majority of us sleep with our phones close That's by. That's I was just thinking. The Could you imagine? Was, oh, man. You're just like Ooh. scanning through your photos to like send a f- whatever. Okay, we were at Green Bluff this weekend and the kids were like, hey, send me the pics. So I can't imagine going through my phone and sending them and then being like, whoa, what? Why are there weird photos of me? Because you're not taking photos of me oh sleeping. And if you are, oh, whatever. Okay, then maybe mm-hmm. that's your new favorite thing. But you're not doing it with my phone. Yeah, I just had the hair stand up my arms because then I just Ugh. thought like, yeah, you're looking through your photos and you see like as if oh, the God. camera were floating, like, oh, like the God. angle of the oh, picture. God. And it's a picture of like us uh, both asleep in bed oh. and something else near the bed or in the bed with us. Oh, And, and then you don't know till the next day that that was happening. You just slept through it all and get a picture. That's that is horrible. Horrible and also a great horror movie trope. Oh. That would be so freaking terrifying. Yeah. Yeah, and that that element just really upset me. Mm-hmm. Ugh, yeah, Mm-mm-mm-mm-mm-mm-mm. yeah, it, it's it's almost worse than being woken up by it when it happens. Totally, finding out later, like how long was that thing there? What, how many what, times has it been there before? Yeah, and how many times has it was hanging around by me and not taking pictures? Uh-huh. Like, what's in my room with me? Yep. Yikes! Yikes. Oh, yeah, that one gave me some good chills. Yeah. Well, since we're talking about like scary things happening in our bedrooms, Mm -hmm. let's talk about closets. mm -hmm. Closets are inherently creepy. I don't even care if you're into the paranormal or not. Mm, To me, like, because a closet is built to house things, to hide things, to like, we use closets when we play hide and go seek. We Mm -hmm. like, when we're having Nerf Wars in our house, like we all hide in the closets. And like, okay, if you, you know, when I'm buying presents when the kids were younger and I didn't want them to find them, I would hide those in our closets. Like closets are a place where we put things to be hidden. So the idea of an entity hiding itself in a closet inherently. I'm just picturing now it's dark, maybe early, early morning or late at night. And and the way our closets are just Mm -hmm. like pushing aside things on the bottom rung. And all of a sudden there's just like the ghost of a little child just like hiding back there. Oh God. Little head whips up and looks at you. I was thinking about something coming through the walls. Like you like pull it back and something pops out through the walls. Or like the way, yeah, the way ours is kind of like that rock or that that cinder block, I mean. Oh yeah. In in the back of the closets. Yeah. Like what if all of a sudden it's like, it looks like the brick is loose. Oh my God. Oh my God. And then you pull it forward and there's a whole nother little space behind Uh. there. Uh, eek, eek. And then like our closet doors have frosted glass on them, which in retrospect, I'm like what a terrible idea Did that was. A shape in there? Yep. Because even like sometimes if I, uh, like the one closet has like my like dresses in it. And if the, if it's a dress with big poofy sleeves, then it like the arm of the dress hits up against the glass. I will get up and rearrange the clothes and push them further into the closet mm-hmm. out of my own paranoia. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Well, let's see what's going on in this closet. Okay. Hello, queen and king of all things spooky. Hello. I come from a long line of spooks. My mom, my grandfather, and I all share the gift of seeing, hearing, and feeling what others cannot. I don't just mean shadow people or loved ones that have passed away. We see everything. Shit I can't even explain. Here's an example of this before we get to the real deal. As a kid of about four or five years old, I would always talk about this man that lived outside of our house. I could only see the back of him. One day, I pulled a total Darren and told him to come in so I could see his face. When I first invited him in, he didn't come, so I went inside and thought nothing of it. I had grabbed the remote and made my way to the couch when I suddenly saw a six-foot-tall man staring right at me with half of his face completely ripped off. I was never more scared in my life. He simply looked at me, winked, what? and then poof, was gone, never to be seen again. Things like this would happen to me all of the time. When my mom was a kid, she would play and talk with ghosts as well. Again, a family trait. Now onto my tale. When I was about seven, we moved to Massachusetts from New York to start over. My family and I moved into a nice, cozy three-bedroom apartment. After coming home from school, I changed into my pajamas and threw my favorite shirt in the hamper to be washed. About an hour later, after homework, I went back to my room to grab my book when I realized my favorite shirt was folded nice and neat on my dresser. I assumed my mom had done laundry while I was doing homework. I went, found my mom, and thanked her for cleaning my favorite shirt. She looked at me, confused, and said, I didn't do the laundry yet, but I will. Now me being confused, I told her what had happened, and she promptly declared, oh, must be a ghost. We laughed and went about (laughs) our days. After that, This would happen every day 
but only with my favorite shirt. Finally, I decided to sit in my room one day and do my homework so I could see who was taking my shirt out of the hamper. And sure enough, my hamper started to shake. My shirt came up from inside the hamper, folded itself, what? placed itself on my dresser, nice and neat. I was okay with this, assuming that the ghost must have liked my shirt too. After the day I saw it and acknowledged it, nothing was ever the same. In the following days, I would come home from school and find my closet doors wide open. I never left it open because it always gave me a freaky feeling. That was red flag number one. Number two was that as soon as I would walk towards my closet, goosebumps would crumb, come over my entire body. I grew sick and tired of being afraid of my closet and decided I was going to confront my fears. I approached the closet door with the intention of shutting it when without any warning, I was pushed into my closet and dragged to the back by someone or something I could not see. I tried to scream, but it felt as if a hand was over my mouth. By now, you're probably thinking I was shitting bricks, but that was not the case at all. After my mouth was covered by that invisible force, I had also felt a sense of warmth wash over me as though I was being protected somehow. Through the small crack where the door met the floor, I saw a shadow walk by my closet. My skin went cold. I was for sure the only person home. I was always the only one home at this time of day because my mother worked until 3 and my siblings didn't get out of school until 3.30. I was stuck in the closet until I heard the front door opening as my sister returned from her school day. And then suddenly I was able to scream and move. Both the entity that had pushed me into the closet and the one that came after had vanished. I shared with my mom what had happened. She thought it was a ghost mom protecting her child, a.k.a. me. My mom did what she always did to protect us from evil, and she saged our home. From then on, I didn't experience anything else in that house, and to this day, I cannot have any closet doors open while I sleep, or even sleep next to a closet for that matter. I really hope you enjoyed my story, Sally. I did, Sally. Yeek. Closets are fucking scary, man. Mm-hmm. Started off good, helping with laundry. <laughs> Just one shirt, though. <laughs> and it wasn't even washing it. It was just taking it Fold out and it. folding it. What do, can you even? It felt like something out of like a Disney movie. I was like, what is this? Bibbity bobbity boo? Where mm -hmm. it's just like boop, 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 boop. And just like comes up out of the hamper to be folded. And like, mm -hmm. what? What a bizarre thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that would be such a. I mean, that would be a pretty good. I mean, okay. Because I think I don't think that one happened. I didn't say, but I don't think like at night or anything. Didn't no. Seem sweet. I mean, if you if you wanted like a paranormal experience, but one yeah. that's not terrifying, but that is very like this can't be anything but the paranormal. Yeah. That would be a solid one to have. Right. To see something like that just float through the air. It's not like threatening. It's not menacing to like fold like folding it makes me think that it's like a ghost of like a person, like a yeah. or at least something, I guess something pretending to be a person or whatever. But it's like that one didn't seem scary at all. But it was very intense. Yeah. That'd be a cool thing to see or to have happen to you. But then it was fucking terrifying when it threw her into a closet. Well, later it got bad. Right. And so I, then I'm it, saying if you just have the one thing. Yeah. Isolated. Yeah. yeah. Well, and then it lends itself to that thing of like, if you don't acknowledge it, mm. you know, it's as soon as how she acknowledged. How do you not acknowledge that? Well, as soon as she did, look what happened. Mm hmm. What do you think it was? Mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, I do kind of like this idea that there were two possible mm -hmm. entities and a good and an evil, you know, and the, the naughty one pulled her into the closet and was holding her captive, oh my God. you know, uh, and the, the other worst. that like warm feeling. I do agree with Sally's mom that it was probably a mom ghost. And that would make sense. Like a mom would fold laundry. A mom would protect mm -hmm. you. So I don't know. Yeah, like a, like a maternal protective ghost and mm -hmm. something else. Something naughty pants. You got time for one more, Dan? Mm-hmm. I was just thinking about how like a lot of times things present themselves as good at first and then get, and then get bad. But then also there's a, a, a common theme of multiple things where there's like, it seems to be, mm -hmm. where there's like a situation where one thing is good and there's something else that's bad. And oftentimes it's interpreted as the good thing trying to protect you from the bad thing, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which makes me just wonder about like, you know, we talk about like uh, where the veil is thin yeah, or where maybe one thing can come through and then that allows something else to come through. Mm -hmm. How does it all work? Well, and I think too about just like humans, actual mm -hmm. human, human nature. It's like, you know... It's always the balance of like good and evil, good and evil. It's like mm. where there is good, there is evil. Where there is evil, there is good. So it makes sense to me that that would exist on another plane in another universe, whatever. It's like mm. everyone's not going to be good. Yeah. You know, they're going to have their own Jeffrey Dahmers and, you mm -hmm. know, theoretically. Mm -hmm. I don't know. 
<laughs> I don't know, bro. Let's hear this next story. Okay, so this and, takes us back to oh, uh, yeah, bonus episode 22, where we talked about uh, the folklore of the dog man oh, from yeah, Michigan. Man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And just uh, for anybody who's not... Uh, uh, who doesn't have access to mm -hmm. the bonus episodes on Patreon, uh, just like a quick Wikipedia. Yeah. I just like to use that for like a quick hit. Great. Uh, a refresher. Yeah. In Michigan folklore, the Michigan dog man was allegedly witnessed in 1887 in Wexford County, Michigan. The creature is described as a seven foot tall, blue eyed or amber eyed bipedal canine like animal with the torso of a man and a fearsome howl that sounds like a human scream. So yeah, the dog face man body. And there's been many reported sightings since that first initial sighting and it basically like um falls into the broader category of werewolf lore. Correct. You know, where it just it got that name, but there has been as we did I think in that bonus episode perhaps. Mm -hmm. There's been, you know, tales of cryptid creatures that are seem to be part human, part dog yep. from all over the place. Yep. Like uh, all over North America. I, we didn't get into it in that one, but all over Europe and elsewhere. And mm -hmm. this particular area, they assigned this name to it. Yeah. And and while this story doesn't take place in Michigan, the dog man has not, it, he's not confined to Michigan from the lore that I was able to dig oh, up okay. online. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hi, I've recently began listening to this podcast. I can't speak. It's a pod class. A pod class. I've been listening to your pod class. Well, thank <laughs> you. Uh, and it's quickly become one of my favorites to freak out to while finishing tedious freelance assignments. The following, though very brief, is one of the strangest things that's ever happened to me. I went to college in Providence, Rhode Island. And during my sophomore year, I agreed to help out an acquaintance by acting in his film project. The role, I soon found out, did not involve much acting at all. <laughs> Instead, I was to dress up in formal wear cake bruise toned eye makeup around my eyes and lie on a cobblestone alley in a pool of, of fake blood, AKA <laughs> chocolate sauce, oozing from my hair. So a glamorous dead woman, great. The project required that I be incredibly still for about an hour. The director offered to buy me lunch off his <laughs> meal plan as payment. Okay. The first 10 minutes or so weren't bad despite my limbs being tangled in a strange position. However, the November evening cold soon grew unbearable, especially since my strapless dress didn't offer much protection from the ground. I tried to meditate and daydream, but by the end of the hour, all I could focus on was trying not to cry. My feet and hands mm. had long gone numb. Everything else ached with the strain of remaining still. By the time the set wrapped, I grabbed my coat and booked it without saying goodbye. Providence has a lot of hills, and when I lived there, every single hill was my enemy. <laughs> they were especially my enemies that night because part of my costume included spindly black stilettos, and I hadn't thought to bring a sensible change of shoes. The wind was brutal, the streets were desolate, the air was black. I wrapped my coat around my shoulders and caught a glimpse of myself in a dark window. With my fake black eye and chocolate-soaked hair, I looked like how I felt, <laughs> an absolute wreck. Eventually, I reached the corner of the long block where I lived. I walked slowly, knowing I'd be home soon. My ankles rolled in my shoes, and I relaxed my grip on my coat. And then I noticed a flicker of movement to my left. I glanced sideways, trying not to move my head or draw attention to myself since there was nobody else around. Seemingly, out of nowhere, an odd shape began keeping pace with me from across the street. The shape was a person, surely, but something wasn't right. I turned my head a little bit more, trying to get a better look. The figure then stepped into the glow of a street lamp. And when I saw it fully, I stopped walking. And it stopped walking. It wore dark jeans. Its hands were jammed in the pockets of a dark green bomber jacket. And its face was a dog. Long brown ears draped over its shoulders. Chestnut brown head, dark brown eyes, and a long, long snout, nearly two feet long, jutting forward. We were both still for a moment while it stared forward. And then, almost mechanically, it swiveled its head to the right and it began to step towards me across the road. You know that marathon where people are, chal where people are challenged to run the whole thing in stilettos? I think that <laughs> night would have qualified me. I burst into tears and ran home on those goddamn shoes all the way down the long block, up three flights of outdoor stairs, and then another two flights of indoor stairs. Providence, what the fuck? And then slammed my apartment door behind me without ever looking back once. I never saw that weird dog man again. Over the years, I've searched online, trying to find a mask or costume similar to what I saw, but nothing even close ever comes up. 
a friend of mine suggested it might be a furry, but it didn't have the proportions or style of a typical furry suit. It really just looked like a normal dude with a horrifically exaggerated beagle head. <laughs> just tonight, a former classmate said they'd been learning about the creatures called dogmen. They're apparently werewolf-like, but according to a totally legit article from a very credible news source, <laughs> The Sun, about 5% look like large, muscular humans with dog heads. Could that be what I saw? Whether it was a dog man or some asshole human, mm -hmm. it was absolutely top 10 worst experience for me. I treasure the memory. Cheers, Marisha. Marisha. <laughs> Marisha. I, I, I do like that she allows the possibility of like whether it was an actual cryptid or just some dude uh -huh. uh, being a dick uh -huh. and just scary, like, you know, terrifying either way. Because I can see, I mean, you have to get totally. a really good costume, but I can absolutely see, I mean, I... I you know, tr did like pranks where I tried to scare strangers when I was younger. I'm sure I How did. How dare you? And uh, and I definitely had friends who uh, did some costume pranks where they would try and freak people out. Like the stuff you see on YouTube now, you know, people yeah. hiding in parking garages and, you know, costumes or with chainsaws or whatever. I mean, interesting that there was no one else she noticed. Because that's mm -hmm. taken it to a weird level where you're not doing it with a group of friends for like, like when you don't have an audience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're just like dressed up like that just following kind of from across the street some random lady towards her place well yeah and like the dynamic and of the it, size of the yeah snout yeah and the dynamic of it being a man chasing a woman or following a woman it's like bad prank bad prank and yeah. there's nothing that says that this couldn't have been a totally different kind of Ugh. situation yeah you know yeah yeah for i can't believe for, she ran with her shoes on also by the way like baby <laughs> rip those things off and go yeah for pranksters maybe maybe don't do that maybe if you're a large yeah. muscular dude maybe don't stalk women at night for 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 laughs yeah maybe not, that's, not funny not funny <laughs> not funny <laughs> not comedy but scary if i mean i yeah. i do like the stories where our fans straddle that line of like could have been could mm -hmm. not have been because mm -hmm. i think that that's scary the either way yeah because i think that that's the space that most of us live in where it's like we see something we think we saw something we analyze it mm -hmm. we sometimes can come to the conclusion that there is no valid explanation other yeah. times we are inconclusive yeah and i i just like the story because it is creepy it is scary you can totally put yourself in her shoes you can imagine the whole thing going down and then imagine going to your apartment thinking like, real? Not real. Real? Mm -hmm. Not real. And equally being terrified to sleep for nights on end because of it, regardless of whether or not it was a dude or a cryptid. Yeah. I love it. Mm -hmm. I love it. Me too. These are the kinds of things that settle into my brain a little too much. Yeah, so many great little moments uh, this episode of mm -hmm. like uh, like the camera, you know, like with the girl in the yeah. bed, like something taking photos of her, just little things for us to reflect on later and creep ourselves out. I think that's the thing about like that second story that got me the most too. Mm -hmm. Like you were saying, like, you know, these things can show up and they can go away and blah, blah, blah. It's like, I know that like we have like the Hollywood version of hauntings. They're like, they're so big and bombastic and relentless. And yeah. I'm not saying that those don't happen, but I believe that more often than not, they're like these smaller things, a, a series mm -hmm. of events. And it, that second story just seems so like normal and approachable and, mm -hmm. and, and possible where it's like, yeah, like a couple things happen. It's uncomfortable. It, you, we're not moving out of this house. We've got to stay here. Yeah. I mean, he didn't say that, but it's like, you know, they're a family of, you know, five or whatever. And it's like, yeah. they got a lot. I'm sure they've got a lot going on. They got a lot of kids, you know? And, and it did, and, yeah. And then it just like kind of just went away. It just mm -hmm. it just felt so relatable. Yeah, yeah. Which makes it scarier. And, and I like that that comes up a fair amount too because, you know, we have all these stories where things build and build and build and they have to get an exorcist or have yeah. a cleansing and then sometimes it still doesn't go away mm -hmm. and the people end up moving out and there's some houses where it's like multiple families live in the house and all experience terror. It's like there's just something they can't get rid of. Yeah. And then there's other stories where... It escalates a little bit and then just inexplicably just goes back to normal. Right. Just as quickly as it came on, it goes away. Yeah. There's no, yeah. yeah I, I, I so love that there is no consistent rhyme or reason to all this stuff. I mean, I sort of wish there was because that's how my brain, then, my brain likes that. Then we could feel like we're figuring it out. That we're close to, you know, uh, you know, exposing all the, the, the truth of all of this. Yeah. But when there's so many different random kind of sequences that pop up here and there and there's no real pattern then it feels like it's unsolvable. It's just a I, mystery. I would like it to be solved. <laughs>
I, I would like to have an answer because then it's then I know how to avoid it and yeah. how to deal with it. I I prefer solutions. That, that's why paranormal horror movies scare me more than true crime ones. I mean, like a, like the thriller where there's like or like a slasher flick mm-hmm. where there's I mean, I guess some of those have parano- paranormal uh, elements, too. But, um, you know, when there's a human villain. Mm hmm. Yes, ob- obviously it could be so terrifying because they can do the worst things imaginable to you. Yeah. But at least you know you're dealing with a creature where there's a set of rules. Mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm. if you shoot them in the head, they are going to die. Right. You know, if you are able to run faster than them, you are going to be able to get away. Unless they have, like, there's all these, like, hard rules. Yeah. But with the world of paranormal, why it's so terrifying to me is you don't know what the rules are. You don't know what the thing that's, if there's something after you and is malevolent. Yeah. You don't know how to protect yourself. True, true, true. Yeah. I mean, that was kind of going back to what we were saying earlier with Smile. Mm -hmm. That's what I liked about that is the big piece. This is not a spoiler, but a big piece of that movie is trying to figure out how to not die and and needing to know what the rules are Mm -hmm. in order to live. Yeah. 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 And the rules are interesting on that one. Mm -hmm. (sighs) Want to do some Annabelle shout outs? I sure do. I'd like to thank the following Annabelles for supporting us on Patreon and allowing allowing us to donate to various charities. Alex Gargano, Austin Rutledge, Molly Jones, Casey Rogers, Angelica Cozine, Vanessa Newston, Seth Vetter, Jenna Dickey, Michael Cure, Chris Barrett, Ralph M., Caleb Bixler, Jada Flory, Krista Fields, Jessica Nicewanger, Sarah Kinney, Alyssa McIntyre, Preston Pinson, Stephen Porch, Colby Smith, Deandra Turner, Brianna Fern, Sarah Bell, E.E. E. Marie 95, <laughs> J.P. Empit, and Mazzy Lovelace. Hmm, what, what a bunch of good, good names. Oh, what a bunch of good names. What Mazzy a bunch of good Lovelace. Annabelle's. I love that. <laughs> uh, I would like to thank the following Annabelles as well. Lene Hassan, Kyle Cutler, Mandy LeMay. Sabrina Cooper, Andrew Cardona, Molly T. Jaden, Elizabeth uh, Byers, Carlos Correa, Paige uh, Goofy, Goofy, Paige Goofy, probably Goofy, not Goofy, <laughs> Sheila Gager, uh, Caitlin Finzel, Ms. J, J Cubed, Michaela Lederhos, D. Bowman's 46, Chad Stop, Stop Ta, or yeah, probably Stop Ta. Shopta? Or Shopta. There we go. Chad Shopta. Uh, Kenzie Kane, Forrest0930, uh, We57, <laughs> Aaron G, Treasure Ghost. I like it. Mm-hmm. Ashley Flotto, Matthew and Peyton, Tim Turpak, and Clay Kingston. Woohoo! And I have the following swoopy shout outs to Brittany from Frankie. Happy birthday. To Riley from Natalie and Julia, we love you, you raggedy aardvark. <laughs> Happy 21st birthday. To Brian from Alex, I love you. To Tiana from Tiffany. Uh, I don't know what the message is. I think it was a happy birthday message. I got distracted. Mm. To to Tiana from Tiffany, happy birthday, happy anniversary, happy holidays. <laughs> I love you. Just making sure I'm covering all my bases. Okay, okay. And to Patrick, from your mom, Elizabeth, and Nathan, too. We love you, buddy. And that is our show, you raggedy aardvarks. <laughs> I know. Isn't that great? Mm-hmm. Thanks for continuing to send in your personal tales of terror to my story at scaredtodeathpodcast.com. You can email us for everything else, info at scaredtodeathpodcast.com. Thanks to Logan Keith, Tyler C. for their work on social media, and to Logan again for running badmagicmerch.com and for producing and directing today. Uh, thanks, Zach Cohen, for custom sound bed creation. Heather Rylander for organizing the My Story emails. And book editor Drew Atana, polishing and preparing listener stories for book number four. Thanks to producer Sophie Evans, who found today's first story, and producer Sarah Finch for finding the second. If you want to watch the show in addition to listening, you can subscribe to Bad Magic Productions on YouTube. Check out this set that Logan spiffed up for the fall. Uh, follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Scared to Death Podcast if you want to see the pics that accompany each episode and more. And if you don't want to hear more ads, if you want to check out two dozen and counting monthly bonus episodes, check out our Patreon. Get the entire catalog ad-free and more. Enjoy your nightmares, creeps, and peepers. Hope you were scared to death. Bye. If spirits threaten me in this place, fight water by water and fire by fire. Banish their souls into nothingness and remove their powers until the last trace. Let these evil beings flee through time and space. Evil may pass through but have no home here within scared to death. Uh, 
it's it. <laughs> I refuse. I, I refuse to be identified in the human realm. 